Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, we are inside this morning. We are going to take our chances with puppies and toddlers rather than with uh, roosters and sheep this morning and see how it goes. We are in Leviticus 15. And I love coffee. The good news is uh, I'm much closer to the coffee pot this morning than I normally am. So. All right. In Leviticus 15, we just got done dealing with the parameters around leprosy. And uh, last week we did 12, which is uh, childbirth, 13, 14, which is leprosy, dealing with leprosy. And so now we have further instruction from the Father to Moshe and Aaron, to Moses and Aaron, uh, regarding discharges. So we're going to be talking about bodily fluids here. Police yourselves. It's up to you if you want your kids hearing about bodily fluids, but that's this discussion is going to be around bodily fluids. <coughs> um, and just as far as clean versus unclean. So we'll just go ahead and get started. Leviticus 15. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any man has a discharge from his flesh, his discharge is unclean. And this is his uncleanness in regard to his discharge. Whether the flesh runs with his discharge or his flesh is stopped up by his discharge, it is his <clears throat> uncleanness. Any bed becomes unclean on which he who sits or on any bed becomes unclean on which he who has the discharge lies and any object on which he sits becomes unclean and anyone who touches his bed has to wash his garments and shall bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Okay, if you have a discharge of the flesh, you're unclean. What you sit on is unclean. What you touch is unclean. Anybody who touches you or the stuff you've touched, it's unclean. It's a basic sanitation. And he who sits on any object on which he who has discharged set has to wash his garments and shall bathe in the water and be unclean until the evening. And he who touches the flesh of him who has the discharge has to wash his garments and shall bathe in water and shall be unclean until the evening. And when he who has the discharge spits on him who is clean, then he shall wash his garments and shall bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Discharge, bodily fluids, mucous membranes. We're, we're going to see all this here. This is um, disease prevention 101. This is dealing with um, risk of infection, transference, communicable diseases. Body fluids are very good at that. Uh, there's sexually transmitted diseases, there's uh, diseases of the blood, there's infections like staph, um, MRSA, ugh. Um, all of these things have to do with body fluids. And it's not polite per se to think about or talk about, but it's completely logical. So this is the instruction as to, you know, if you're unclean, how do you not get everybody else unclean? Well, don't go around spitting on people. Or if somebody's sick, don't lie in that sick person's bed, right? Logical stuff, but it had to permeate our human thought processes for thousands of years in order for it to become logical. I think this is way before germ theory. Germ theory is what, 1800s, I think? Yeah, and then it was uh, proven out by the advent of microscopes, crude microscopes at first. Late 1800s? My brain's just starting to get spun up, and I can see from here a red squirrel that's eating my chicken food, and there's a small part of me that's quite murderous right now, wants to shoot that thing in the belly. Anywho... 
any saddle on which he who has the discharge ride becomes unclean, and whoever touches any of that which was under him is unclean until evening. And he who is carrying them up to wash his garments and shall bathe in water and be unclean until evening. If you touch their stuff, you're unclean. Wash yourself, you're unclean until evening. And anyone whom he has a discharge touches without rinsing his hands in water shall wash his garments and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And the earthen vessel which he who has the discharge touches has to be broken, and every wooden vessel has to be rinsed in water. And when he who has a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days from his cleansing, and shall wash his garments, and shall bathe his flesh in running water, and be clean. And on the eighth day he takes for himself two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. No, he takes for himself two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, and shall come before Yahweh to the door of the tent of appointment, and shall give them to the priest. And the priest shall prepare them, one as a sin offering, and one as an ascending offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before Yahweh because of his discharge. And I think a lot of this is highly symbolic. It's like you've been healed, as we talked about last week. Um, the healing of the leprosy, the, the one bird that goes through the death and resurrection, basically. Um, so here we have an ascending offering, uh, which would be um, burnt with fire as a sweet fragrance unto Yahweh. And then we have the sin offering, which would be slaughtered and would there be some mental, emotional, spiritual um, transference of, okay, I'm done with this thing. We're get, And we'll see when we get to 16, more of this transference dealing with the scapegoat. But, okay, I'm healed. No more discharge. Good. There you go, bird. Thanks. Okay. So that's the sin offering. And the priest shall prepare them, the one is a sin offering, and the one is an ascending offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before Yahweh because of his discharge. Okay. And when a man has an omission of semen, then he shall wash his flesh in water and be unclean until evening. And any garment and any leather on which there is semen shall also be washed with water and be unclean until evening. And when a woman lies with a man, and there is an emission of semen, they shall both bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And when a woman has a discharge, and the discharge from her flesh is blood, she has, she has to be in her separation for seven days. And whoever touches her is unclean until evening. And whatever she lies on during her separation is unclean, and whatever she sits on is unclean. And anyone who touches her bed has to wash his garments and shall bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Remember, 4,000-ish years ago, um, not saying that these were crude people, I don't think, I think people-wise, they were very similar to people today. I don't think people change all that much, but technologies certainly do, uh, says the guy talking to a sideways iPhone to the internet while reading a, you know, however many thousand year old book. The sanitation wasn't all there, okay, which is why we see this here. We know blood, there are bloodborne pathogens, there's all kinds of infectious disease in the blood. We know that in, um, in semen, yeah, same issues, um, you know, and this, this discharge of the flesh is, uh, in the beginning of 15, is you know, believed to be venereal disease or interpreted to be venereal disease by a lot of people uh, who are potentially smarter than I am, who have done more research on this. So we have <laughs> venereal disease, semen, a woman's monthly flow, and then, as we'll get into this, we see... Um, uh, bleeding issues okay all of these are related to fertility all of these are related to um, bodily fluids interesting and so we have a, a Torah a bit of instruction here about what all these things what do we do if we find ourselves in these situations and there's instruction earlier the first instruction that we have from the father is be fruitful and multiply it tells that to adam go and take dominion over all the earth and then we have the covenant of the circumcision with abraham right and so there's 
We have rules about how to use our junk, y'all, the appropriate way and the inappropriate way to use it, right? And so here in Leviticus 15, if you find yourself with the VD with a discharge, you probably weren't doing the things that you ought to have been doing, which could play into why we have a sin offering here as well. Complete conjecture on my part. Moving on. <clears throat> and if on the bed or on any object on which she sits, she with the monthly flow, when he touches it, he is unclean until evening. And if a man lies with her at all and her monthly flow is on him, he shall be unclean seven days and any bed he lies on is unclean. So if you're going to do the deed during that time of the month, you're unclean for seven days. And when a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, other than at the time of her monthly separation, or when she discharges beyond her usual time of monthly separation, all the days of her unclean discharge shall be as the days of her monthly separation. She is unclean. So we treat these two things the same. Your monthly flow and then your other flow, which I am about this much acquainted with. Which is interesting if you think about it. I probably know more about, you know, space and the deepest depths of the ocean than the particulars around a woman's monthly flow. I know all the anatomy. I mean, clinically I know, but I know I learn by doing. I've never done that, we'll just say. But again, we have uh, four things that this is addressing. Uh, Leviticus 15, we have venereal disease or discharge, we have semen, we have monthly flow, and then we have irregular flow, or uh, what is it called here? A discharge of blood for many days, which, you know, we'll just jump over quick. Go to Matthew 9, 22. Assuming that you're awake and that your fingers work, go to Matthew 9, 22. Matthew 9, 22. Oh. We'll just go to Matthew 9, 20. And see, a woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. A woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched his zitzi, touched the zitzi of his garment, Yeshua's garment. The zitzi, zitzi out the tassels, uh, which is in Numbers which we could go look at. We got time, we probably will go look at. For she said to herself, if only I touch his garment, I shall be healed. But Yeshua turned, and when he saw her, he said, take courage, daughter, your belief has healed you. And the woman was healed from that very hour. From 12 years flow of blood. So she would have been unclean for 12 years, meaning no contact with other people, which would have been horrendous that would have sucked to say nothing of the disease itself whatever that was so we can go to uh, numbers uh, which has a Hebrew name uh, Bemidbar Bemidbar that's a ridiculous name um, so we go numbers 1537 1537 <laughs> uh, yeah, well, immediately before that, we have the uh, don't be gathering sticks on the Sabbath because this guy whose job was probably to gather sticks on the Sabbath was out gathering sticks, or I'm sorry, his job was to gather sticks. He was out doing it on the Sabbath, and uh, they stoned him to death to make an example of him, so don't do that. And then we go to 37, and Yahweh... Where did this come from? It came from Yah, from the Father, the Most High. Spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, Make zitzi on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. We still have generations, y'all. And put a blue cord in the zitzi of the corners, and it shall be to you for a zitzi, which I have a footnote here. Uh, so it says, See explanatory notes, zitzi. Thanks, bro. That helps. <laughs> on the corners of your garments throughout their generations and put a blue cord in it and it shall be a zitzi for you and you shall see it and remember all the commands of Yahweh and shall do them. 
and do not search after your own heart or your own eyes after which you went whoring, so that you remember and shall do all my commands and be set apart to your Elohim. I am Yahweh your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim to be your Elohim. I am Yahweh your Elohim. So here in just, I mean, three inches of text in my book, we have that Yahweh spoke to Moshe, and we have the Tetragrammaton, we have the name Yahweh four or five times, we have the word ZT three times, we have generations twice in an area that is this big. Pretty important. And so it was touching the Zitzi on Messiah, uh, the tassels that healed this woman of this 12 year blood issue, which she would have been removed, she would have been unclean for 12 years based upon Leviticus 15, which is what we're going back to now. So, actually, we're gonna have another sip of coffee. Fay. There we go. Oh, yes. Tremendous. <laughs> we'll pick up at uh, 26. Any bed on which she lies all the days of her discharge is to her as the bed of her monthly separation. And whatever she sits on is unclean as the uncleanness of her monthly separation. And anyone who touches them is unclean and she'll wash his garments and she'll bathe in water and be unclean until evening. I think they had a, like a pillow or like a little small blanket that they sat on for separation, right? Um, Cause again, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what their blood absorbency protocol was at the time. I'll just say that. I don't think they were all pearl girls. You know what I mean? They, they it wasn't like, Esther, when you're at the store, pick me up a box of pads, okay? Okay, all right, thanks Ruth, you're welcome, okay. There wasn't any of that that I know of. I don't think there was a Walgreens and a CVS on every corner. So I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but I don't know. So, <clears throat> okay. And anyone who touches them is unclean and shall wash his garments and shall bathe in water and be unclean until evening. But if she is cleansed of her discharge, then she shall count for herself seven days, and after that she is clean. And on the eighth day she takes for herself two turtle doves or two young pigeons, and shall bring them to the priest to the door of the tent of appointment. And the priest shall prepare the one as a sin offering, and the other as an ascending offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before Yahweh for the discharge of her uncleanness. Thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness when they defile my dwelling place, which is in their midst. Thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness when they defile my dwelling place, which is in their midst. Some heavy words there. But there's a lot of protocol. In fact, we're going to get into, uh, in 16, we'll see there's even further protocol for Aaron, the high priest, and his sons, the priests of uh, the Levitical line of priests of the tribe of Levi. So all of this is, in a certain way, prophetic towards Messiah, right? Thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness. Mm-hmm. Yep. Intercession. Hebrews 8, 6. Mediator of a renewed covenant. Lest they die in their uncleanness. Uh-huh. When they defile my dwelling place. Don't defile this, bro. Uh, which is in their midst. Mm-hmm. And so... But it's also... So that's kind of the spiritual New Testament interpretation of that passage but then there's also the tactical practical yeah the it was called the set apart tent of appointment it was set apart if you were unclean you didn't go in there um remember <clears throat> in leviticus 10 uh aaron's two of aaron's four sons uh were drunk in service to yahweh and got destroyed by fire right there's a very high standard set here as far as being in service to the Father and coming and approaching the face of the Father. 
which is why we should all be thankful for salvation through Yeshua Messiah, that we have an intercessor, that we have a mediator of a renewed covenant so that we can seek the face of the Father and not be utterly consumed by our uncleanness. Okay. This is the Torah for the one who has a discharge and for him who emits semen and is unclean thereby. And for her who is sick in her monthly separation and for one who has a discharge, either a woman or a man, and for him who lies with an unclean woman. Okay, good. We got that squared away. Glad, glad to hear it. Okay. Oh gosh, that's good. <clears throat> I was thinking I could just pause and have a moment and then start up again, but I'm not going to pause. I'm just going to have another sip of coffee. Oh, yes. Thank you. All right. Leviticus 16. And so um, we have an awesome group of people that follow along with this study each week. And I'm really, really thankful for you guys. And I've been emailing back and forth with uh, one of y'all, uh, Oilfield Disciple. And we were actually just yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, maybe it was two days ago. Sometimes time does weird things in my brain. Recently, I'll say within the last 48 hours, emailing about, uh, baptism of Messiah in Matthew 3 and talking about sin and this and that and the whole nine and he said you know actually this all plays in perfectly to Leviticus 16 which we're going to be in this weekend what a coincidence ha ha coincidence and so I just wanted to say man I'm really thankful for the discourse back and forth and I'm thankful for you guys who are playing along in the home game each week, all my Hebrews and Shalomi homies. Um, and I just, I love it because I do not know everything in this book. As I've said before, Brother T, not Pastor T, Brother T. <clears throat> but boy, I'm willing to learn. And so, and that's the point of this. I want you guys to learn too. And I want you to read your own Bibles with your own eyes and your own testimony and your own convictions and come to your own conclusions about the word of your creator and your Messiah, okay? So, but hey, if I can help you with that, I'll bang sure do it. So, I just thought it was really cool that there was somebody who was paying that much attention, you know, and, and how the Father uses that because there's, yeah, there's no coincidences. So here in Le uh, Leviticus 16, we're going to get into some things, <laughs> the scapegoat, and uh, we're going to see some interesting things here. There are a lot of rabbit holes you can jump down in just a few short passages in Leviticus 16. I'm going to address some of them. I'll give you some anecdotal references that you can pull threads and jump down holes if you want to, but we're not going to go terribly deep in a couple of areas where we really could. We could burn hours. <clears throat> but the reason we're not going to burn hours is because they're extra biblical. They're not in the Bible proper, this Bible proper. Although they do appear in some places in the Apocrypha, and in other places, I know some of you guys are intrigued, like, shut up and get to the point, T. Hey. Sorry. Uh, and they appeared not only in the Apocrypha, but uh, in other canonical, what were once canonical texts, then were excluded from the Bible. Uh, and then books that were non-canonical, meaning that they were adjacent to the writings that became the Bible, but were never incorporated into by certain sects, the uh, Yazidis, um, I mean, we're going to see one guy in here that appears in uh, Yazidism, Sufism, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, mysticism, uh, and then even had a Greek inter interpretation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a big deal. So, without further ado, let's drink off. Sixteen. 
And Yahweh spoke to Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aaron, as they drew near before Yahweh and died. Remember, Levi 10, Leviticus 10. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aaron, as they drew near before Yahweh and died. <coughs> they were killed because they were drunk in service to Yahweh. Pretty much. That's something to remember. Um, there's no drunkenness in service to the Most High. Remember that. The two are mutually exclusive. Doesn't mean you can't drink. What was a Messiah's first miracle? Water into wine, baby. Doesn't mean you can't drink, but it does mean you can't be drunk all the time. And you certainly can't be drunk when you're performing important offices for the Father. <clears throat> so, bear that in mind. And Yahweh said to Moshe, speak to Aaron, your brother, not to come in at all, not to come in at all times to the set apart place inside the veil before the lid of atonement, which is on the ark, lest he die, because I appear in the cloud above the lid of atonement. Let's see. All right, so we have our picture here. Oh, that's a pen. Remember out here, we got, this is the slaughter place, and this is the wash basin, and this is before the tent of appointment where they would bring their offerings. And then back here is the uh, Holy of Holies, the most set-apart place. So this is the set-apart place. This is the most set-apart place. And so the father is saying, listen, Moshe, tell Aaron, don't come back here lest he die, because I will appear upon the lid of the tent of appointment in a cloud. What does that mean, T? Well, obviously, it's ancient aliens. I don't know. It means what it means. It means what it says. Uh, interpret it however you like. But I'm a, I'm a biblical literalist, I guess, if that's the phrase you want to use. If that's what it says, that's what it means. Now, a big part of that means having the proper context to understand what it actually means, which is why... We don't cherry pick verses here. <laughs> In fact, I recently got a subtangent. I recently got an email from somebody who's like, how do you reconcile, I think it's Romans 6.14, against your belief to keep Torah? And I was like, well, it's easy. Read all of Romans, not just Romans 6.14, and understand that Paul was Saul of Tarsus, and he was a biblical scholar, a, a, a Torah scholar. And that when he says the law and the Torah, that there are myriad different laws that are referenced. At certain points, he references in certain writings up to seven different laws. So, and also understand that the law of sin and death is the law that was imposed by the Pharisees and the scribes, not the law of the Father, right? And it's that law, the law of the Pharisees and the scribes, that Yeshua came to rail against, which is why the Pharisees and Yeshua Messiah did not get along, right? And he's like, you den of adders. I mean, that was John, right? Pit of vipers or whatever he said. Uh, but man, they did not get along because they had corrupted the Father's law. They'd made it a burden. They made it too hard to keep. And so that's why we read the whole book and we read things in context because that context gives us the actual meaning of the passage. We don't just cherry pick verses to, oh, I like this, this means this, this reinforces my preconceived notions, it makes me feel good about myself. No, that doesn't work. So we read the whole book, and in reading the whole book, we can get the context of why would he not, Moshe and Aaron, appear uh, before place inside the veil, the lid of atonement, which is the ark, lest he die, because I appear in the cloud above the lid of atonement. Short answer, I can only imagine it means precisely that. Don't come back here, because I will appear in a cloud above the lid of atonement on the ark of the covenant, and it'll kill you. Okay. 
with this, Aaron should come into the set apart place. With this, this is what you bring. With the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as an ascending offering. He should put it on the set apart linen. He should put on the set apart linen long shirt. Set apart meaning holy or sanctified. Like holy and sanctified literally means set apart. So it literally means something that's separate from everything else. Like uh, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Set apart meaning you don't do your normal worldly things on Shabbat. You do the Father's things, which we should be doing our best to be doing every day anyway. But <laughs> do be extra good at remembering on Shabbat. Okay. He should put on the set-apart linen long shirt with the linen trousers on his flesh and gird himself with a linen girdle and be dressed with a linen turban. They are set-apart garments, and he shall bathe his body in water and shall put them on. And he shall bathe his body in water and put them on. Let's just flip back to Matthew 3 for a hot minute. I know. Lots of flipping lately, but come on, guys. Just work with me. Matthew 3. Right, And they were immersed by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. 3, 6, right? 3, 11. Indeed, I immerse you in water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. Right? So we have, and then we have uh, Yeshua Messiah, 13. And Yeshua came from Galilee to John at the Jordan and was immersed by him, or, or to be immersed by him. But John, Yohanan, was hindering him, saying, I need to be immersed by you, and you come to me. And Yeshua answered him, saying, Permit it now, permit it now, for thus it is fitting for us to fill all righteousness. Then he permitted him, and having been immersed, Yeshua went up immediately from the water and see the heavens were open, and he saw the spirit of Elohim descending like a dove and coming upon him, and see a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my son, the beloved, in whom I delight. This immersion, this cleansing, ritual cleansing to uh, initiate service to the Father. Okay, so Leviticus uh, 4, here at the end of Leviticus 4, And he shall bathe his body in water, and shall put them on. And from the congregation of the children of Israel, he takes two male goats as a sin offering, and one ram as an ascending offering. And Aaron shall bring the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. So he's, this is a great point. He's got to get himself good to be in service to the Father before he can do anything else, right? He's got to bathe himself, put on his special clothes. I mean, and I'll tell you, I have, it's the difference between, think about this, what you wear matters. It's the difference between, like right now, I have a pair of running shorts and a t-shirt on. I'm pretty laid back right now, right? If I put on a suit, how does my body language change? Okay. If I put on a plate carrier, how does my body language change? Mm-hmm. Right? Boots versus sandals. How do you walk? How do you carry yourself? What's your attitude like? Right? And so... I have, like, I have certain garments that are for things. I had one back when I was a heathen that was specifically for uh, dabbling in the black arts back when I was a heathen. I burned it. I don't have that shirt anymore. <laughs> a lot of negative energy connected to that shirt. But it was it becomes almost like a ritual. It is a ritual, right? Uh, think about your morning routine, right? If you're, a, if you're somebody who wears a suit for a living, right? And you groom yourself, you, you brush your teeth and do your hair up and you're standing in the mirror, right? And you've got your tie and you get your tie going and you're doing your cuffs and your cuff links and you throw your suit jacket on and you stand there and look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, yup, ready to conquer the world, right? It's the same ritual you put your plate carrier on and you just, your whole 
body language, your whole attitude changes. It's like there's a shift in your frequency. There's a shift in your vibration. I think that matters. In fact, it does matter because the father tells Aaron, you wear these things when you're in service to me, right? And all of the, all of the energy that went into the sanctification of these garments, the gravitas of these garments, or you put these on, boom, signifies you're in service to Yahweh. That's cool. So he has this ritual, right? And then from the children of Israel, he's taken two male goats, uh, and then one of them is for him, that he's got to get him right. Remember that. As we pointed out before, even priests make mistakes, right? Aaron, Aaron has to cleanse himself of sin before he comes to the Father on behalf of the congregation of the children of Israel. All this is powerful stuff. It's very cool stuff, and there's lessons in here for us in, in today's modern day and age. <clears throat> I wonder if they had set-apart coffee. I'm going to start a conglomerate, and I'm not even kidding. I've been thinking about this. I'm going to start a conglomerate called Sanctified Industries. Um, email me if you're interested, because I think there's going to end, again, another tangent. I really believe that there's going to come a time where we won't be able to do business with the world. we got to do business with somebody. I cannot produce 100% of my own inputs, right? Thus, community. But that community doesn't necessarily need to be somebody that I can reach out and touch right now. Thus, sanctified industries. Let's start networking now. Let's get things from each other now. That if somebody says in the future, you got to take this marker, you can't do business with the world, I can go, no, I'm not doing it. I intend to say, no, I'm not doing it anyway. But it'd be nice to know that I already have a source for goat's milk or corn or wool or steel or knives or whatever wood right whatever sanctified industries it's i think we should start building that infrastructure and building those relationships and that network now before it really matters so that we have it when it really matters now <laughs> and somebody said t how do you say shut up and read the bible that doesn't make any sense that means i need to shut this off and turn the Bible back on, right? I need to read the Father's words and, and quit using my own words. That's what I mean by shut up and read the Bible. So T, shut up and read the Bible. And he shall take two goats and let them stand before Yahweh at the door of the tent of appointment. This is 16.7. And Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Yahweh and the other lot for Azazel. Azazel? Azazel, depending on how you pronounce it. Azazel. And he shall take the two goats and let them stand before Yahweh at the door of the tent of appointment. And Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Yahweh and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which he has the lot for Yahweh fell. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the lot for Yahweh fell and shall prepare it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for Azazel fell is caused to stand alive before Yahweh, to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness to Azazel. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house, and shall slay the bull as the sin offering, which is for himself. And shall make a fire holder filled with burning coals of fire from the slaughter place before Yahweh, with his hands filled with sweet incense beaten fine, and shall bring it inside the veil. Um, we're going to stop for a minute. Who is this Azazel guy? This is where things get interesting. Um, I am both intrigued, because again, there's no coincidences, right? And a bit ashamed to admit that I was, you guys know, I was in metal bands. Um, if you're familiar with the story of, in Genesis, of fallen angels, and if you've read the book of Enoch, I had a business, a production company called Watchers Entertainment. The Watchers, I'm getting goosies telling you this. 
the name of one of the bands that I was in was Nephilim, the Nephilim, the Giants. And my stage name was Azazel. Yeah. It's the first time I've ever admitted that on camera. There's no coincidence, right? Yeah. Azazel. Let's unpack this as much as we can without jumping down rabbit holes. If you have the Book of Enoch, which is an extra canonical text, it's part of the Apocrypha. It's in some Apocrypha. It's not in other Apocrypha. I believe it is in the King James Version of the Apocrypha. And if you're wondering what is the Apocrypha, it's A-P-O-C-R-Y-P-H-A, -A, Apocrypha. It is a series of books that are adjacent to the Bible and in, at some point were included in the Bible, but were then removed when the 66 books of the Bible that we currently have were canonized, meaning bound together. The book of Enoch, um, Enoch and Enoch is mentioned in Genesis. He's in the lineage of the patriarchs. Most of, I mean, in the Bible, you only find named angels, uh, Michael and Gabriel. Enoch had seven. Michael, Gabriel, uh, Uriel, so forth, so on. A great book, by the way, is called Uriel's Machine, um, relating to Stonehenge. Fascinating book. Uriel's machine. Anyway, again, all of this is extra biblical, so take all of it with not a grain of salt, but like 14 pounds of salt, okay? But Enoch was in the lineage of the patriarchs. He was somebody's grandpa. Brain's not working right now. Clearly, he was somebody's grandpa. He's in the lineage of the patriarchs. But the book of Enoch talks about fallen angels that came to earth and uh, their offspring, they were the watchers and their offspring were the Nephilim, the Nephilim, the giants that uh, the flood of Noah wiped out. Well, the flood of Yah, which Noah was a part of, wiped out. In those days, there were giants, okay? In David's day, there were giants as well. I think there's gonna be giants again. I'm thinking more and more about this. Uh, our brother, the uh, Atlanta Viking, and I have been chatting about this. Enoch writes about Azazel. Azazel was allegedly one of these uh, fallen angels. Azazel was responsible for teaching men the art of war and teaching women deception through beauty. And... At one point in my life, early on, when I was in these metal bands, I think the spirit of that thing was not necessarily indwelt in me, but it was heavily informing me and guiding my actions. And it's when I pulled away from that, was starting to pull away from that, that I was violently attacked and almost killed by demons, which I've discussed in my Torah testimony, which just go to put in bare independent testimony. Um, it's, a, it's long. It's three part, two hours long. But that story's in there. And so whatever that thing is, whatever name you put on it, it's real. Um, and you can look in Genesis 6. In fact, we'll go to Genesis 6. We have time. Somebody also said last week, uh, listen, don't apologize for how long your videos go. I said, okay. Genesis 6, and it came to be when men began to increase on the face of the earth and daughters were born of them, that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men and they were good. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. 
And Yahweh said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever in his going astray. His flesh and his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim, the Nephilim, were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of Elohim came into the daughters of men, men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, the men of name, the men of renown, as some translations say. Right? And Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Okay, so that's Genesis 6. Enoch deals with that. And then, so you go from there, who's this Azazel guy? Well, it's entirely possible, and this is, this is something that should be addressed. It's entirely possible that Azazel, that is a personification now, is actually a translation of archaic Hebrew, which means the high place. And so what they would do, in fact, we'll see here in a little bit, like they would take this goat up to this high place and they would throw it over this cliff and it would be battered and broken um, in an effort of atonement for the sins of the children of Israel. So it's entirely possible that Azazel literally just means in archaic Hebrew, the high place. So when they sent it to Azazel, they were sending it to the high place. That's the logical explanation. And so take that, put it over here. Azazel being this fallen angel, uh, one of the seven archangels, I believe, according to Enoch, is also um, bound until the end of times, the last day of judgment, at a place called Dudael, D-U-D-A-E-L, Dudael, in the wilderness, in the desert somewhere. And there is a mountain, Mount Azazel, in the same-ish area of Sinai. At Mount Horeb, all of that area, they're all kind of there together. And whether that's, you know, folklore and verbal tradition, oral tradition, or what, who knows. But it's there. And he's said to be bound to the end of days. And he is associated with evil. He is, in certain traditions, he is uh, either assisting or the serpent in uh, the garden. He is... And this is interesting. The Apocalypse of Abraham. Yes. I bet you didn't know that book existed. Some of y'all probably did. Most of y'all probably didn't. In the Apocalypse of Abraham. Interesting reading. Uh, very hard to substantiate the validity of it, the historicity of it. But in the Apocalypse of Abraham, if we go here to Genesis 15:11. Flip to Genesis 15, 11. And I know we're bird walking a little bit here this morning, but like I said, there are rabbit holes here and I'm just, I'm just pointing at the rabbit holes. We could spend hours jumping in and out of them. But here, if we go here to Genesis 15, 11. So just for a little bit of context, we said, uh, This is Yahweh and Abraham. After these events, the word of Yahweh came to Abraham. In a vision, do not be afraid, Abraham, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward is exceedingly great. Then he said, bring me a three-year-old heifer, three-year-old female goat, three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took all of these to him, to Yahweh, and cut them in the middle, and placed each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. And the bird of prey, and the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, and Abraham drove them away. That passage right there is in the Apocalypse of Abraham. It's in the Apocalypse of Abraham. And those birds, one of them speaks to, uh, speaks to Abraham and is talking trash to him. Like, who do you think you are? What kind of God do you think you serve? And it's said in the Apocalypse of Abraham that that bird was Azazel. Take it for what it is personification of the embodiment of the something, the spirit of that thing uh, coming and trying as we saw with Yeshua in the wilderness, coming and trying Abraham as he's in the middle of trying to be of service to the Father. And then this will be the last little bird walk that we do here. Interestingly, 
if we go to John, the book of John 8.56 here, because this, this right here, we're talking about this, uh, this portion here in Genesis 15 of Abraham and this vision that he had talking with Yahweh. But we go to John 8.56, and I know it's all New Testament, not 1 John, John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 8, <clears throat> 8.56, this is Yeshua speaking. Uh, Yeshua, well, we'll start 54. Yeshua answered, if I esteem myself, my esteem is none at all. It is my father who esteems me, of whom you say that he is your Elohim. Yeah, it ain't me, bro. It's the father. And it's the father that you acknowledge is what he's saying. And you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say, I do not know him, I shall be like you, a liar. But I do know him, and I guard his word. Ooh, dang. Yeah, remember that when somebody comes at you. Well, you don't have to do all that. Yeah, I do know him, and I guard his word, said Messiah. Your father Abraham was glad that he should see my day, and he saw it and did rejoice. This is the vision of Abraham. in the apocalypse of Abraham. This is what is cool, is this vision that Messiah quotes to the Pharisees, right? Or whoever he's arguing with here, I believe is the Pharisees. Yes. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Whom do you make of yourself? He says, listen, number one, who are you to claim Abraham when you're not doing his things? Number two, Abraham prophesied me. He saw me in a vision. Okay, and this is in John 8, 56. But if we go back here to Genesis 15, there's no accounting of that here in the Bible. But what there is an accounting of that vision in is the apocalypse of Abraham, meaning that Messiah was familiar with this writing, this teaching of the apocalypse of Abraham, because it's not anywhere in this Bible, it being Abraham having a vision of Messiah. But it is in the apocalypse of Abraham. How cool is that? I just wanted to show you guys that, because all that, that all ties together with this Azazel guy. So now we can legitimately shut up and get back to reading our Bibles. So there's some wormholes you can jump down, some rabbit holes you can jump down if you feel so inclined. Um, the Apocalypse of Abraham, the Book of Enoch, the Abraham's Vision of Messiah, um, <laughs> the uh, Talking Birds when Abraham is at slaughter, is slaughtering, um, there's, there's so much there, so much there. And I, I didn't want to just skip over it. So, okay. And Aaron shall bring the goat and, but the goat on which the lot for Azazel fell is caused to stand alive before Yahweh. And the idea being here that they would send this thing out to Azazel, which is either the high place where they'd throw it off the thing or to Azazel proper, which basically would be like to be damned to hell. They would send it out to be damned to hell. Okay. Either way, symbolically here, they're giving one portion to the father. They're giving what belongs to the father to the father. And then they're giving another portion that which is sin. They're getting it outside of the camp. They're getting rid of it highly symbolic of what we should be doing, right? Like anything that's not of the Father in us, we need to get rid of it. Anything that is of the Father is his and we need to be giving it to him. Let him drive the bus. Uh, highly symbolic. But the goat on which the lot for Zazel fell is caused to stand alive before Yahweh to make atonement upon it and to send it into the wilderness to Azazel. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall slay the bull as a sin offering for himself. 
shall take a fire holder filled with burning coals, a fire from the slaughter place before Yahweh, with his hands filled with the sweet incense beaten fine, and shall bring it inside the veil. Shall put incense on the fire before Yahweh, and the clouds of incense shall cover the lid of atonement, which is on the witness, lest he die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his fingers on the lid of atonement on each on the east side. Also in front of the lid of atonement, he sprinkles some of the blood with his fingers seven times. And he shall slay the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and shall bring its blood inside the veil, and shall do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull. Sprinkle it on the lid of atonement and on the front of the lid of atonement. So do these things with the blood of the bull, slay this goat, do the same thing with the blood of the goat. And he shall make atonement for the set-apart place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So now he's making atonement for the tabernacle, the set-apart place. The tent of appointment because of the uncleanness for the children of Israel. The covering of blood, the redemption through the blood. The blood, the blood, the blood, like... Praise the Most High for Yeshua Messiah and His atoning sacrifice. Okay, this is all, it's all prophetic. It all points to Messiah, right? Because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, it takes blood so that we can come before the Father lest we die. Because, <laughs> and he shall make atonement for the set-apart place because of the uncleanness of the, of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. What's transgression? Not doing the things you're supposed to be doing. Sin is a transgression of the law. First John 3, 4. And so he does for the tent of appointment, which is the dwelling, which is dwelling with them in the midst of their uncleanness. And no man should be in the tent of appointment when he goes in to make atonement in the set-apart place until he comes out. And he shall make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out of the slaughter place that is before Yahweh and make atonement for it. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the slaughter place all around. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his fingers seven times and to cleanse it and set it apart from uncleanness to the children of Israel." So he goes outside to the slaughter place, which we showed earlier, wherever that went. I need to be keeping this thing handy. So he did the things in here. Now he comes out here and the horns of these four uprights on the corner. He's going to put blood on those, right? Which is common, right? And all these different sacrifices that they're doing, it's common stuff. Okay. And it shall go out of the slaughtered places before Yahweh. Some of the horns of the slaughtered place sprinkle some of the blood on his fingers seven times for the children of Israel. And when he has finished atoning for the set apart place and the tent of appointment and the slaughter place, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and shall confess over it all the crookedness of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins and shall put them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. And the goat shall bear on itself all their crookedness to a land cut off. And he shall send the goat away into the wilderness, the scapegoat. And it's important to understand here that the father is the goat bearing the sin. Yes, there's a transference here from Aaron to the goat. But what this is doing is relieving this burden of sin from these people so that they can worship. It's the same thing, although not nearly as powerful. Let's just get that straight, right? Like nothing compares to the atoning sacrifice of Yeshua Messiah, right? That's it. Like that's the reason we're here. The reason we, we can do anything that we do is because of Messiah. But this is in that vein where there's something interceding. There's a transference of our guilt and our shame and our sin onto something else so that we can get rid of that guilt, that shame, that sin, and then be in service to the Father. Okay, so this was the mechanism that they had before we had Messiah. But it's very, it's still very 
um, instructional for us. There's a lot of parallels here that make sense. Um, and the idea here being that you give to the Father what's His, right? And then what's not, you get rid of it, get out of it, get it out. Um, I often pray, Father, if there's anything in me that's not of you, that you would remove it and that I would banish it in Yeshua's name. Amen. And if you pray that prayer, and I encourage you to do that, uh, oftentimes people, uh, people burp, um, you know, people have to fart, uh, sometimes people puke or they get a bunch of mucus and they have to spit it out. Um, it's these, these humors that they called it an alchemy, these bodily fluids that we just saw in 15 that carry disease, but that are also believed to be inhabited by spirits and demons. They're all tied together. When you get into um, a lot of really bad dark arts revolve around these things because they are pathways, gateways for demons. And so when you rebuke in the name of Yeshua Messiah, boy, you can see people have to burp or they got to pee all of a sudden real bad or they just have to spit. All this stuff comes out and it's like, yep, yeah, get it out. That's not of you. That's not of the Father. That's of the enemy. And so, yeah, it's just, it's just interesting how it all ties together. Aaron shall then come into the tent of appointment and shall take off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the set-apart place and shall leave them there. And he shall bathe his body in water in the set-apart place and shall put on his garments and shall come out and prepare the ascending offering and the ascending offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people and burn the fat of the sin offering on the slaughter place. And he who was sent... A and he who sent away the goat to Azazel washes his garments and shall bathe his body in water. And afterward he comes into the camp. And the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the set-apart place, is brought outside the camp. And they shall burn their skins and their flesh and their dung with fire. And he who burns them washes his garments and shall bathe his body in water. And afterward he comes into the camp. So take the carcass outside the camp, burn it. Just FYI, I was thinking about this the other day. That many people, that many animals outside the camp and burning is a great way to keep flies down. Do you know how many flies there would be? The blood and the flesh and the fat and then this and then that. There'd be flies everywhere. It would drive me insane. Millions of people, millions of animals. Yep, take them outside the camp, bro, and burn that. I don't want anything for any insects to be eating, these swarming insects. I'm good. And this shall be, and I have this 29, here's 16, 29, uh, through the rest is all highlighted in my Bible. And this shall be for you a law forever. In the seventh new moon, on the tenth day of the new moon, you afflict your beings. Afflict your beings means fasting. That's what it means. If you're unsure of this, go read the quintessential chapter on fasting, Isaiah 58. Um one of my favorite chapters and I love Isaiah because he pulls zero punches so you afflict your beings and do no work it's a Sabbath the native or the stranger who sojourns among you so everybody does no work for on that day he makes atonement for you to cleanse you to be clean from all your sins before Yahweh it is a Sabbath of rest for you and you shall afflict your beings a law forever a law forever. So twice we're told do no work, twice we're told to fast, and then we're told it's a law forever in just this much text, little tiny bit of text. And the priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as priest in his father's place shall make atonement and shall put on the linen garments, the set apart garments, and he shall make atonement for the most set apart place and make atonement for the tent of appointment and for the slaughter place and make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. This is what they just went through. This is like the synopsis of this chapter, okay? Everything that they just did in Leviticus 16 is, it's recapping. This is what you do. This is why you do it. And all this for you shall be a law forever. And this for you shall be a law forever to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. That's 1634. 
and he did as Yahweh commanded Moshe. That's the end of Leviticus 16. So from this, we get the Day of Atonement, which is prior to uh, Sukkot, the Tabernacle of Booths, or the Tabernacle of Booths, the Festival of Booths, or the uh, or Tabernacles, as it's called, the Dwelling in Booths, Sukkot, S-U-K-K-O-T, which this week, or this week, come on, brain, this year is the beginning of October, I believe. So, yeah, dwell in booths for eight days. It's a blast. Shabbat to Shabbat. It, it's, <laughs> Pastor Joe says, Sukkot is when God commands you to go camping. And it's, it's fun. Um, it's a party. It's a festival. So there we have in Leviticus 16, the concept of the scapegoat and atonement. And, and atonement, which I always like to break down as at one mint. How do you get at one with the Father? Well, you've got to separate yourself from that sin. And so we have that mechanism in Leviticus to do that. We have a mechanism now through Hebrews 8.8, 8, uh, the renewed covenant, Yeshua Messiah, to separate us from our sins. So it's important that we do that. It's really important that we do that. I find that if I don't repent, if I don't atone for my sins. I mean, Yeshua is the atonement, right? If I don't claim the authority through Messiah, and if I don't repent, I have a hell of a hard time coming to the Father. I just, like, I can't find the words. I'm not interested. My life gets sideways. Like, things suck. And so I've really made a muscle out of repenting. Just flex that muscle. When you need to, flex it. And sometimes it's just a whisper. It's all you got is just a whisper. Father, I messed up. Please help me. I repent of this. And I'm like, I really repent of this in Yeshua's name. Other time, it's, it's, you know, it's just like, it's like just dumping a bucket out. It's that, right? Sometimes it's just a drip, drip, drip. Other times it's whoosh. Uh, but you have to give it up. You have to remove the weight of that sin and that guilt and that shame so that you can seek the face of the Father and not perish. And as I've said before, the reason we seek the face of the Father is so that we can get patched up, we can get fixed up, we can start getting some scabs on our wounds so that we can take our rightful place on the battlefield and start winning victories for the kingdom. Um, and it's about us, but it's not about us. It's about us in as much as we have to be in a good position of strength so that we can serve our creator by serving everybody else around us. That's how it's about us, but it's really not about us. And I think it's that mindfulness there is, is exemplified by Messiah. He had to take moments for him to be good, but he had to get good so that he could take care of everybody else around him, right? And so let's be Christ-like, ladies and gentlemen. Let's be like Messiah as much as we can. <laughs> That's Leviticus 15 and 16. Um, thank you guys for being here. Love you guys. You're awesome. And uh, just keep doing what you do. Sanctified Industries. Think about that. Think about it. Shalom and blessings.